Well, man, I'm super grateful to be here. I don't know about y'all. This is a great group on a Labor Day weekend. I'm glad you're here. And it is a Labor Day weekend, and sometimes we don't always look at our holidays, but I want us to think about Labor Day for just a moment and where it came from. We, this weekend, we'll celebrate those who make America build and think and plan and create. If you don't know where the original Labor Day started, it either started in the heart of a man by the name of McGuire, McGuire, or McGuire. Two men get credit for that. Uh, two different men. Some records said in 1882, 1882, Peter McGuire, who was the general secretary of the Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners, decided it would be wonderful to celebrate the laborers who make this nation and decided that he would push forward a general holiday for the laboring class. Those, he said, who deserve honor for from rude nature have delved and carved all the grandeur we behold. There was another gentleman by the name of McGuire who also had the same thought. He was from a different place and a different state and he also thought that there should be a day to honor laborers um, once labor day was instituted in the united states of america both of these men received credit in fact at the very first labor day parade in new york city both men led the parade mcguire and mcguire who gets credit for labor day someone said god come on you've been to sunday school already i'm grateful for you a hundred percent but it's not McGuire or McGuire, is it? And if we take them down to the earth level, what I mean is that it's the laborer. It's the worker. I don't know if you read a book uh, years ago that was written, uh, well, it was 2007, by Amy Schultz called The Forgotten Man. You know who the forgotten man is. It's the worker. Uh, Schultz talked about the Great Depression and how there a lot of em emphasis was put on policy and some of the key uh, shakers during uh, the Great Depression, including the Great New Deal and all of the, the Good New Deal and all of those things, but she, she went and chronicled men who were butchers and workers and laborers and people who were in the workforce that said, you know what, though things are hard, we're going to make and eke out a living for our people. We're just going to put our hand to the grindstone and work hard. And she said, these are the forgotten men. Sometimes those in prominent positions get the credit that's really due to those who are not seen, the producers. Would you agree with that or no? It's not that people in prominent positions aren't important. It's that those who are not in prominent positions are important. And this is what Jesus is going to tell his disciples. Because the disciples want to be in the prominent seats in the kingdom. And Jesus is going to unnerve them by what he says. You want success? Do you want to be great? And who doesn't? Then you're going to learn that greatness comes not by prominence, but by service. Amen. If you want to be the greatest of all, you have to be the slave of all. If you have your Bibles, would you look at Mark chapter 10? I want you to see what Jesus has to say this morning, because I think without it, none of us will ever achieve everything that we were made to achieve, and there's not a person in this room who does not want to fulfill their God-given purpose, deep in your heart, you desire, I desire to do just that. And so if you don't hear this this morning, you could miss out on what God has you here for and why he has you here. In fact, the Bible says it this way in Mark chapter 10, if you have your Bibles there, in verse 42, Jesus called them to him. That's his disciples. In verse 42, Mark chapter 10. Hold on a second, y'all. That ribbon in your Bible works really well when you put it in the right place. Amen. Jesus said, uh, I don't have it memorized, Randy. I know. I get it. You know those who are considered rulers of the Gentile lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. It shall not be like the world. You know what the world wants. They want control and dominance, but that's not you. That's not what you're called to. Disciples, whoever would be great among you. In other words, and it's the way it's phrased is important, it's, it's okay to want to be great. 
uh, it's wonderful to win. In life, it's wonderful to be successful, to be on this journey towards purpose and then fulfill that. But if you're ever going to achieve that, it won't be like the world. There's a better way. There's another way. In fact, it's the only way, and that is you have to be a servant. Look at verse 43. You have to be the servant. And then verse 44, whoever would be first, it's okay to want that and desire that to be good at what you do. However, you've got to be the slave of all. And then Jesus states this in verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be what, y'all? We see that in the nativity. When the angels come out with praise concerning the birth of Christ, and where is he? On a throne? In a stable. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus models for us today the pathways to becoming a great disciple, a great person. The ways of the kingdom are starkly in contrast to the ways of this world, aren't they? Do you see that already? While the world may prioritize comfort and power and status, Jesus elevates humility and service. And says these, these qualities, humility and service, are the true measure of greatness in the kingdom of God. Jesus shows us the ways of the kingdom are different from the world. And I want you to see two ways that are in this text that are different than the world. The first way is this, in verses 32 to 34, that life comes through death. Life comes through death. And Jesus is going to tell the disciples that victory is coming, y'all. It is coming, and the kingdom's coming, but first there's going to be suffering. In other words, he's going to say there is a way to triumph, but triumph is often down the paved path of suffering. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear it's going to be hard. I don't want to know that I've got a struggle ahead, nor did the disciples. And I'm guessing neither do you. No one wants to know, oh, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. But that's what we hear, it's hard. You remember having your first child? Do you all remember those days? Yeah. I had a neighbor say, oh, I wouldn't bring a child into this world. Why? It's hard. Thanks a lot for the encouragement. See you later. I want to hear that. We, we know life is hard. Marriage is hard. Friendships sometimes are hard. Anything worthwhile, help me out, is hard. It's hard. And Jesus is giving this principle, and he's saying, like, I want you to know it's going to be very difficult, the path I'm going, but it is victorious. Look at verse 32, because here's what Jesus shows, and that is in this demonstration of the way that leads to life, is that he is committed, determined to submit to the Father's will. Verse 32, and they were on the road. They were on the road, Jesus and the disciples. So can your mind right now, just go ahead and picture it. I like to kind of have those images. Some of you are better with that. Picture this, Jesus is leading the disciples. They're on a road, and notice where the road is going. It's going up to Jerusalem. Don't miss the word up, because that is the way every time you go to Jerusalem, you've you're going to flow because Jerusalem's on a mountain. They're going up, and Jesus is walking ahead of them. So do you get the picture? And by the way, there's some statements I'm going to make here, just real pithy statements that I just want you to consider. There's a lot on the cutting floor that I'm not bringing to this sermon this morning, but I want you just to consider these things without a lot of context. But I want you to see Jesus is ahead of them because I want you to know the forward advance for the believer uh, is in always following after Jesus. Sometimes we might think, if I follow Jesus, I've got to go backwards, or I've got to give up. No, Jesus is always out in front, and if you follow him, you are now moving forward. If you're not following him, you're not. And so here Jesus is out in front of the disciples, and they are amazed. Look at verse 32. They are amazed, how much so, that those who followed were afraid. The disciples' amazement was because of the Lord's determination. He's going to Jerusalem. What's waiting for Jesus in Jerusalem? Not his friends. Not a welcoming committee. Not from the religious elite. What's waiting for Jesus are enemies. 
And the disciples are amazed that he would set, as Isaiah says, his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. What type of determination must this be to submit to the will of the Father? What did Jesus say then? Was the pathway or the program that he was going? Well, it is the kingdom agenda here. He takes the 12 aside, and look at this in verse 32. Taking the 12 again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. This is the third time that Jesus has told the disciples that he's going to Jerusalem to die. This is why they're amazed that he is so determined to go there. They still don't understand the plan. They don't understand the pathway. They don't understand the way of suffering, and the way of death leads to life. Jesus is teaching them this, and he's teaching them that Suffering leads to triumph. Everything that Jesus does here demonstrates his absolute greatness, though. And his greatness is seen in his service through sacrifice. Who's the greatest of all? Well, Jesus. And why is he the greatest of all? He said, well, because he's Jesus. You're right. And what does Jesus demonstrate as the greatest of all? That he is the servant of all. The greatest of all is the greatest servant. And one way we see his greatness and his sovereignty in his service is the fact that he is determined to go to Jerusalem and not by accident, but Jesus has dominion even over those who are going to take his life. Jesus does nothing by accident. He is not a lamb that is accidentally led to the slaughter, but on purpose does not open up his mouth, but goes to the slaughter. He's not a martyr that suffers and dies because of his beliefs and his stands, and then he gets on the wrong side of the religious company. No, he is on his way to commit a sacrificial act on purpose within his sovereignty. Let that rest on you just a minute, because I was reading something that had nothing to do with the sermon this morning, and this quote jumped out, and so I cut and pasted it to the sermon, because I was was like, I can't leave this out. This is too good. It was from Adrian Rogers, who just had a way of saying things that are memorable. Adrian Rogers said, God planned your salvation before the planet was swung into space. Your salvation is not an ambulance brought to a wreck. It was in the heart and mind of God before anything happened. In other words, your salvation, my salvation, did not come about because God reacted to our sin, but because In eternity past, God decided he would save us when we sin, so he doesn't just show up to a mess. He knew we'd be a mess, and he already had the answer to that mess, and Jesus is that, and that is why Jesus is going to the cross on purpose to fulfill the eternal plan of God. So no wonder the disciples were so amazed because he is committed. They're not gonna get in his way. Remember Peter? Oh, no, 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 you're not going to death. Peter, get behind me, Satan. Could you imagine following Jesus because of his dogged commitment to the will of God? This is what it takes to be truly in the pathway of greatness. And then Jesus' identification. He is going to be the our sacrifice. Why? Because look, he says the Son of Man is going, which is where Jesus now is identifying with us, mere humans, flesh and blood, so that Hebrews 4.14 could come home to roost with us, that he, our Lord, is our high priest, and our high priest suffered like us. He sympathizes with us. Why? Because he's been tempted in every way we've been tempted to be frail, to be weak, or to be fearful. Yes, in every other way that you've been tempted, he's been tempted, and yet he's without sin. He's not other than us. He came to be one of us in order that he might save any of us who would believe on him so all of us who believe can be saved. This is what Jesus does. He identifies with us, and then he says, I'm gonna be rejected. Rejection, I'm coming to identify with you so you can follow after me and understand rejection is not the end of the world. It wasn't the end of his life, even though the religious leaders hated him. And just one more question that I won't follow up with a lot of context. Is it possible that religious people could despise Jesus? 
He's not only going to be rejected by his own, he's going to be persecuted. Notice this, that the religious leaders are going to hand Jesus over to the Gentiles. They are going to mock him. It means to make fun of him. Our Lord came to serve us willing to be made fun of by dirt. People that he breathed life in are breathing out insults. He could have mashed them like an ant. But he says, no, I'm going there because I know the plan that has been in place throughout all of eternity, and I'm going to serve not only to be made fun of, but to be spat on. I remember the very first place I was ever spat on. You ever been spat on? I can't say that I've been spat on many times, thank God, but that is not a great experience. That is not a baptism you want. It might be why some of you don't sit on the front row. I, I don't know. <laughs> but I just say, it's okay, come on down. <laughs> sit under the glory spout where the glory comes out. So, Jesus said, I'm going to crucifixion. I'm not just going to be rejected. I'm going to be crucified. This is not at all what the disciples could have envisioned, but we read over in Hebrews 9, 27. If you're here with us on Wednesday nights going through our Hebrew study, we just read this text that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. And Jesus came, our great Savior, became our servant in order to die for us and take on judgment so that we would not ever have to incur the wrath of God. Amen. He died once, and was judged on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we sinners could be the righteousness of God. This is incredible service. But that didn't stop there because Jesus told the disciples, yes, this is going to happen. And notice the text. Notice the text, verse 33. And, excuse me, verse 34 at the end. And after three days he will rise. What will he do, church? Did he stay dead? It's Labor Day 2024, and Jesus is just alive today as he was 2,000 years ago. Amen. He's alive. Do y'all remember an old song? I serve a risen Savior. Yeah. Come on, it just sounds good. I know that he is living. Oh, man. I don't know the rest. Go ahead. <laughs> That's why I have it written down. <laughs> No, I do. That song came to my heart. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He's alive. We sang it, one of my favorite hymns, uh, are, is the, sang, the hymn we sang this morning that the Gettys wrote. And I love how we sang about the resurrection of Jesus Christ because as Christians we know that he did die and he did not die a martyr's death. He died a dominion death, a death that was planned before the creation of the world in order to serve us and then through that suffering triumph through death into life and now is alive for us so that I could say, yes, he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Loves you so much that he would die for you and loves you so much that he now lives for you. We don't just see his service to us in his death. He's alive. Amen. And he still serves the body. Jesus' life is a pattern for us to follow, but more than that, more than an inspiration, it is an enablement to live out the life he's called us to live as well. The disciples had not learned this lesson yet, that real greatness comes through service. So look at verse 35 and verse 36. It's James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And just for a little more context, Mark doesn't really throw them under the bus so much like Matthew does. But Matthew tells us it wasn't just James and John, but they sent their mama to go ask Jesus this request. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. What was the request? One at the right hand, one at the left is stressed here. In a royal court, there are two places of high honor right next to the living monarch. And out of the monarch, out of the throne, 
comes these who serve alongside with great strength. They want to be Secretary of State and Secretary of, Secretary of Defense. They want to be right there with Jesus. Can you imagine just being there? And here Jesus is telling them, we're going to Jerusalem, and there when I go there, I'm going to die. And they said, oh, well, that's great. Uh, how about we have thrones? Right? I'm not making too little of that. That's exactly what happens here. It's a boldness of her request. Now, just to be fair, Jesus did tell them, you can read about in Matthew 19, the disciples would sit on thrones in his kingdom. And so all they're hearing and all they're grasping is there's coming a kingdom. There's coming a, there's coming a rule. Our Lord's going to dominate, and we're going to be serving with him in this messianic kingdom. And so why don't we just go ahead and ask him for um, some prominent seats? And maybe even too. And the sadness of the discussion of the cross, they don't want to think about what was going to happen, only what was going to happen afterwards. I, I, probably, not, probably not the case for most of us, but I think it's worth mentioning that sometimes we can sometimes focus on heaven, and we should, on heaven, and what's coming for the believer, and forget that there is still earth to live. What exposes, what exposed here is their pride, isn't it? I mean, what Jesus does is he tells them about the cross, and the cross reveals God's purpose, but it also reveals man's sin. I want you to think about the cross for a minute. And time you think about the cross and the symbol of the cross, you think about victory. But you also remember that in the cross, we have sin represented, and our sin in particular. And the cross was God's revealed eternal plan, but it also reveals our sinful hearts. And while Jesus laid out God's purpose, we see the disciples' pride. Which, which leads to the second way of the kingdom here. Look in verses 35 through 45. The greatness comes through service, through service. Jesus' response to them on, at this request is very gentle. Isn't it, isn't it gracious? I mean, what, how, how would you respond to that? How, how would I respond to that? Why do you... Have you not heard anything that I've said? But Jesus is very kind and gracious because he tells them very importantly what they need to know because he is going to leave them with the responsibility of carrying forth the mission. So he is taking the disciples from one place to another. It's a journey. It's a pathway. And they have to learn that up is down in the kingdom. And everything that seems forward is backwards in the kingdom. And the priorities of the kingdom don't look like the priorities of the world. However, once they grasp this, then they'll know God's purposes for them. And they'll be able to endure the persecution and the rejection and even the death they're going to face. Y'all, the Christian life is not meant to be easy. If anyone ever told you to become a Christian and things will get easy and better, they didn't give you the full context. Because you live differently when you become a Christian. You live differently than you did when you were in the world. The priorities that you once had are not now your priorities. The purposes that you once pursued are not the ones you now are after. Everything changes. If you are in Christ, you are a new creature. Old things become new. Like everything, everything, everything is new. Including the direction of your life and your heart and your mind and your aspirations and your ambitions and your glories. So Jesus' response was a very gentle rebuke, wasn't it? They don't understand. Jesus asked them a question. It was a rhetorical question. They should have just been quiet. The question is, will you be able to drink the cup I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? What is the cup that Jesus is going to be drinking, y'all? Well, in the Bible, there are two types of cups or two metaphors for cups. One is a, a cup of joy and rejoicing, and that one sounds awesome. I'll drink that with you in the new kingdom, Jesus would say later. But this cup is not that cup. This cup reveals that Jesus is talking about something that is unpleasant and not joyful. In the real sense, it is a cup of suffering. It's the cup that is represented in Jeremiah 25, 15, where the Israelites are going to drink the cup of God's wrath. It's the cup of Isaiah 51, 17, a, a sour cup. And all through the Old Testament, a cup of sorrow. It's the cup that Jesus asked the Father in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39, could this cup pass from me when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's about to go to his death and suffer for our sin and separation? Could this cup pass? Can you drink this cup? Can you drink this cup? Will you be baptized in the baptism I'll be baptized with? 
You know the word baptism is an interesting word. Um, you know there's translations, so we have an English translation that takes our Greek and Hebrew Bibles and gives it into a way we can read. And then there are words that can't literally be translated, so we transliterate them. And a word for, for an example of that would be baptism. It's been transliterated. It means that we don't really have the full effect in the English word. It means to be completely immersed. Are you going to be completely immersed in my suffering? Are you going to go through what I am able to go through? They answer, we are able. Were they able? Well, yes and no. They had to learn a lesson like Peter. When Peter said, I'll never, I'll never, what did he say? I'll never deny you. Did he? Well, yes and no. In his own power, standing around the campfire, he denied Jesus. In fact, he denied him three times. But when he learned to trust in the power of the cross, to be enabled with divine power, he went to his own death for Jesus. These two disciples, James and John, right now they think they're able, they're not, because they're thinking about their own abilities, but one day they're going to learn to trust in the ability of Christ and to walk in the grace of his strength. And James will be the very first martyr of the Christian church when Herod Agrippa takes a sword and kills him because of his faith, and he will not recant. And then John, old John. You love John, don't you love John? You never read the gospel according to John? It's one of the greatest treaties of the gospels you'll ever have. The three letters that he writes to the church shows how much he loves them. And then the book of Revelation was authored by this same John. In case you didn't know that, it's the last book of our Bible. It talks about in things and John writes that letter you know where he writes it on a prisoner island because there's a Roman emperor by the name of Domitian you probably have heard of him he was an evil and a wicked man who tried to have John killed at one time and when that didn't work out he just sent him to a to an island called Patmos away from all of his family and friends to suffer John's going to know what it is to drink the cup of sorrow James is going to know but they'll not be able to do it in their own strength. In the pursuit of their prominence, they will find failure, but in the pursuit of Christ's preeminence, they'll find success. See, what Jesus does is give them this word. Look in verse 40. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those who it has been prepared. In other words, the seats have been prepared for those who are prepared for them. He knows they're going to suffer but he also knows that the sovereign God of the universe has given positions for people to sit, and, he, and he's given them purposes for which they should go after. Look at verse 41. You can imagine what happens. This doesn't even probably have to be put in the text, but I'm glad it is because it just tells us how human the disciples are. When the ten heard about it, they began to be indignant. What brought indignation? Well, the conflicting interest. It wasn't that the disciples here were angry at James and John. Did you not just hear what Jesus said? They were thinking about their own prominence too. We can't lose sight of the divine prerogative here by God choosing a leader. And I can't lose sight. As I was meditating on this passage for the last two weeks, it, 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 it caught my attention that it was just James and John that were there. Just James and John. Just previous to this account, there were three men on, an, on a mountain with Jesus where Jesus showed them uh, the glory of his kingdom, or God showed those three the glory of Jesus, three men. So the guy missing in this account is Peter, whom Jesus has already said is the leader of the twelve. And it's as if James and John seem to be going behind the leader. Let's cut Peter out. Maybe they thought, I don't know, this is, look, this is not in the Bible, but you got to ask yourself some questions sometimes. Why? Maybe they thought, Peter's a good leader, but he's not as good as we are. And they were circumventing Peter and creating disunity in the organization called the Disciples, what we would call the church. We all know this. 
that everyone thinks maybe that somebody else should be the leader at times, and maybe it was that there were other people egging them on, like, hey, James and John, you really guys, you really ought to talk to Jesus, but I don't think Peter's got it. Because, listen, here's the deal. Everybody in the stands thinks the greatest quarterback on the field is the one that's the backup, not in the game yet. These are conflicting interests, and we understand this, that in any organization, in any relationship, in any church, in any business, in any family, when there are competing interests, there's conflict. James put it this way, not this James, but the half-brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James. What causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have. And you know what he said? Now look, listen, listen now. He's talking to people in his church. You desire and you don't have, so you murder. Murder is selfish. Whether it's the murder of a living being or a preborn human, it is for us to have what we want and not to have what we don't. How deep is that desire to have what I want that James says, even in the church there, this is your murder. You covet, you cannot attain. So you fight and you quarrel and you have not because you ask not. And then even when you ask, listen to this, you don't receive. Here's why. Because you ask it wrongly to spend it on your own passions. James and John, they weren't wrong in asking Jesus a request. They were wrong in how they went about asking and what they asked for. They, in fact, were a little bit humble. They didn't even ask for who's one and two. They're just like, we don't care who's one and two. You just put us on the thrones. We're fine with that. But what was the problem? They're asking a request to spend on their own passions, not for the glory of Christ and not for the good of the church. You you have to learn is the, the stewardship of leadership is like the stewardship of giving. We give not to get, but if we give, we get. Do you get it? Say amen if you get that. Okay, I move on. Because let me just let me just back that up. Because we who despise the nonsense of the prosperity gospel despise it because it says. If you give, you get. So it seems like the motive to give to God is because I want something from him. When stewardship is not what I get from him, but what I give to him. And God wants us to be stewards not for what he gets from us, but what he gives to us. In other words, stewardship is not from you, it's for you. It's an interesting principle, right? And leadership's that way. Service is that way. We don't serve so that we might get recognition. But if we serve, we get recognition. This is so amazing, right? This is why Jesus said, don't do anything by selfishness or ambition. Paul writes it this way, I'm sorry. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only on his own interest, but also on the interest of others, having this mind among you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Well, if I serve, you say, if I serve, you know what's going to happen. I'm going to get run over. If I serve, you don't know the organization I work for. You don't know the people I'm around. You don't know my boss. You don't know the backstabbers around me. And if I serve, I'm going to be a doormat. John Maxwell, who's written a great deal on leadership, and I probably, like you, have read quite a bit, and I agree with this. He has a book, the, the, the Success Journey, and he said, really, when you think about uh, success and being on that journey towards success, you need two things, the right picture and the right principles for getting there. Jesus says, here's the right picture. I'm going to give it now this context. The right picture of success is me. Jesus says that. Not, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the picture. Picture me. I came to serve you and not to be served. And the principles for getting there are the kingdom principles, which means the way of greatness is through service. He then 
let's finish it up here. Look at verse 42. He then contrasts the world's way again with kingdom way. Verse 42, he says to them, you know that those who consider Gentiles lord it over them. In other words, the Gentiles, they want, they want dominance. They want, they want control. They see people, lost people can see, they can see people as stepping stones or rungs on a ladder instead of people to be valued and not to be stepped on, but to be helped ahead. Not to be stepped on, but to be served, he says. This is the way of the kingdom is different than the way of the world. Verse 43, it shouldn't be this way among you. Whoever would be great among you must be a servant. It's the word diakonos. It's the where, where we get the word deacon from. It, it means to, to serve like a deacon serves. Not everyone in the church can be a deacon, but everyone can deke. And you don't have to have a, a title to deke. Amen. And the reason we even have deacons is because they've been deaking so much. People say, those guys deek so much, they should be a deacon. But everyone ought to deek. And not only that, but then he says, and whoever would be great among you, be your servant, and whoever would be first among you would be slave of all. We don't like that word, but 124 times in the New Testament, you have the word doulos that is oftentimes in the New Testament translated servant, but the accurate, the accurate translation is slave John MacArthur says maybe there's a conspiracy here I don't know but I don't know that it's that that it might be just this in America we hate the idea of modern slavery and the modern definitions have evolved but we know slavery encompasses ownership even evils like forced marriages government imposed labor and human trafficking the 13th amendment of our constitution is outlawed that type of slavery, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't value at all slavery. In fact, we, we know that it is evil. It is an evil you know, to bring somebody into subjection, whether that's a subjection of forced labor or sex trafficking or any other exploitation. But we Christians voluntarily are slaves. Oh, I'm a slave of Jesus. How many of you would say I'm a slave of Jesus? I'm a slave of Jesus. Okay, that's right, five. Good. <laughs> I'll preach this. We're going to stay here because we are his slave. Uh, so, so it's really hard for me to make this next statement because it's what Jesus really says. He says, you're not just my slave, you're the slave of everybody. I don't like that. I'm just going to be frank with you. But my flesh does not like that. This is why the ways of the kingdom are not the ways of the world. I mean, the ways of the Gentiles are clear. Like you see where the Gentiles work and what success is for them, prominence and status and wealth. Not you. And then he said this. No, I had to finish it up here. He said, now, this, and this is really the key, a really key phrase, so we'll come back to it next time. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Notice this, that Jesus said, I, I've, came, I, I've came not to be served, but to serve. And he does. He serves us still now. He's our great high priest. He's in heaven right now praying for us. He intercedes for us. He's our great intercessor. He's our shepherd in John 10 who guides us and protects us and calls us by name. He serves us by enabling us. We are constantly working, but only working in the power that he has. We can't fulfill our calling unless he serves us to fulfill it. Nobody's going to say today, you know what, I'm going to do what God wants me to do unless you say, I'm going to do it by God's grace if he enables me and empowers me to do it so that we can't say, yeah, I'm able to take that cup and drink of that cup and I'm able to have that baptism we can't but we can say but God if you empower me if you enable me I'll do whatever you ask me to do and Jesus came simply for us to serve us but not just as an example but as our empower these are simple words aren't they but sometimes the simplest words as uh, St. Clair Ferguson said are the hardest you think about simple words they're hard to do they're simple but they're hard you know when someone says hey 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 Get over it. Easy said, hard to do. Uh, someone says to you, forgive. You're like, well, that's easy to say, hard to do. Trust me. Hmm. How about this one? Stop worrying. For some of us, wait till next year. Serve. 
one another. Serve one another. It's not our makeup. It's not our flesh. But in Christ, we see our call that we are to serve and can serve those whom we love and value them as Jesus does, to find our identity in Christ and value in Him, not our position, not our prominence, but in the person of Jesus Christ. That my value is not based on what I do or what people say that I am, but who Jesus Christ has made me and what he's making me to be, that my position in him is far more important than my position in this world. Then I can serve. Father, thank you that you've given us this passage. And Lord, you've given us your sacrificial service to purchase our salvation. You've also given us, Lord, an empowerment to serve you, to fulfill our calling. I want you right now, as you're heads are bowed, you're praying, I want to ask you this question. What would it look like for you to step into greater service today? Where you live and where you work and where you play or where you worship? What would it look like to be stepping into greater service in your home? What would it look like to step into greater service at your work, your place of employment? to see others advance and to cheer others on? What would it look like to, right here in your own community, serve? We have some incredible servants in our church. I was reading a story a little while ago about Bob Little, who was at the Moody Bible Institute, preaching every day, serving pastors, his schedule, John Phillips says was unbelievable. Couldn't believe anybody could keep his schedule. In the middle of his busy schedule, someone called he, whom he didn't know and said, hey, I heard you're on the radio and my dog died. And the only friend I have in the world is my dog. Would you come bury my dog? And that man left and went and buried his dog. And his friends asked, why did you do that? You didn't have time for that, he said, because that man had one friend in the world and it was his dog. And how could I not go and minister to him? The word minister means to serve. And there's people that I'm talking to you right now, you're serving. You're serving weekly and regularly in ministry even. I called a man today, Mike. Some of y'all know Mike. He preaches at Seagrass, serving dear people every week by sharing the gospel with them. And I called Mike because I knew I could call him. Mike, I just got a call at 7 in the morning, and a friend of ours who's, who's a pastor is sick with the flu at another church, First Baptist Keystone. Can you go preach? And Mike's like, I'll be there. That's, a, that's service. Those of you who serve as greeters, as caring for those in our parking lot and making sure that we're ready on Sundays and you're here on Monday mornings and you're caring for the church by cleaning and vacuuming. I just want to cheer you on because this is the picture of the kingdom. And I just want to ask myself, I want you to ask yourself, where can I step into greater acts of service where I live, work, and play? Father, thank you for empowering us. The way of the kingdom is not the way of the world. We're grateful that you've shown us that. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?